I guess we'll get to it here okay. on the first question from uh, Lawrence from Naugatuck, Connecticut. Um, he has questions on the average time to build, the modularity of construction, legalities, benefits, complications of purchasing property with an existing house. Um, anything we can okay. uh, say on that? Yeah, I can grab that one. And because we do have a lot of questions, and as a result, we'll be going through them pretty quickly. If you want to jump in, if we um, miss part of what you were inquiring about, please feel free to jump in and elaborate on your question. But other words, average time to build is, um, like a lot of questions, there's so many variables, it's hard to really give a definite answer. But um, if you buy the dome kit, one advantage to building a dome is a lot of the, the parts and pieces are already pre fabricated for you. So for instance, uh, in the picture that they're showing in the dome um, that's on the screen here, you know, three guys, if those three guys were there, they could easily have this dome up in a couple days. Um, probably the dome, it's the, the framework that they're putting up now and probably one day. And then the plywood paneling might take a couple days depending on. Um, so the, you know, it goes up fairly quickly, but it really depends on the experience, how many people are in the crew, what size dome is it? Are you building on a hillside or flat terrain? There's a lot of uh, variables, but I guess maybe the easier way to say it is, it's probably about the same as any kind of a custom house. Um, you know, parts of the dome are gonna go up significantly quicker than a regular house. And then parts of it might go a little bit slower, um, but it will average out to be about the same. Um, as, as an average house. <laughs> Hopefully that helps answer that question. That's, it's a tough one to answer, but the, the dome itself, the shell part of it that we can provide as a kit does go up very fast. So just a, just a few days. Uh, yeah. There's a quick thing on that. I said something about the um, uh, purchasing property with an existing house on it. Is there any complications there? Yeah. I mean, I try to think of anything that you'd have to do. Differently. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, Really, you got to look into your zoning. So typically, um, and it really depends on where you're at, but the majority of the zoning is going to restrict you to one home per lot. Um, so it really just depends. So if there's already an existing house there and you're unable to divide the lot, then you have to see if you can get it rezoned for multiple residences on, on a lot. So it really just depends on your building department and the zoning in your area that... Uh, would dictate that. Um, those would be the only legalities really that you run into. There with you know, maybe a benefit to purchasing a property with existing house is you might have all the infrastructure in place for sewer, water, or septic. Um, electric might be all there. So if, if the house itself was in need to be demolished, you may have some of the infrastructure in place. But other words, uh, yeah, hopefully that answers that, I guess. It's it's really depends on your zoning. So Okay, I don't know if Lawrence is here, but that answers his question. Yeah. Uh, okay, I guess we'll move on to the next one. We have uh, Jenny from uh, Vista Bella, Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, what material will be used in order for this structure to withstand hurricanes? Uh, Dennis? Well, it's the standard materials that we use. Actually in front of you, the current picture you're showing, you're seeing is three quarter inch plywood uh, triangle panels. It's not half inch, it's three quarter inch. The connection hardware system is a big part of it. And uh, I'll, if you want to put me onto the screen, um, we've got two different connectors, two different sleeves, we call them. One is the standard one, which we call the super lock connector. This is the hub that we have. And what we're dealing with is this part fits into that part. So it fits in like this. That's our standard connector. There's four holes, four bolts. We get into a hurricane tornado area and we switch to this one. Um, it's a lot longer, a lot bigger. It's a wider uh, grab onto the two by eight structure. But from the standpoint of, of hurricanes and tornadoes, um, Tanner, if you've got that uh, photo of the previous dome, this is the original picture of Beach Dome 1 on Topsail Island in North Carolina. 
Basically, it was about 150 feet from the ocean, had a 10 foot high dune in front of it all the way along. Um, the town is Surf City, actually, in uh, North Carolina. And hurricanes came along in 96. You'll notice all the pilings that we've got, but those are basically 12 foot pilings. So they're designed to be about four feet, five feet in the ground. That's all they had to be. So this is after two hurricanes. First one took the dune away and the next one moved the dome. And you'll see there it says beach dome location after hurricane frame. It's 80 feet moved back from the original where you see the piers, the, the pilings standing up uh, on that front uh, ocean front lot. Notice the house to the right of where the beach dome was with no roof. However, the one next to us still has a roof and it's still there. But the one next to that, to the left of that house is gone. Pilings are gone, the house is gone, but here's the dome, it's intact. It's sitting there, the second floor uh, addition of a bedroom on each side is still attached to the dome. So the dome components did get, didn't give away. It was the pilings because the sand had been loosened up by Bertha two months earlier and, uh, and really did redistribute it across the area. So here you are. Um, what components do we use? It's the same comp. Well, actually it isn't the same components. I think the beach dome originally was built with the super lock connected to the smaller one and our larger one, the ultra lock, uh, was used on the replacement of this dome, which is this one, not in the same spot, but on the north end of the island. And you can see the pilings. Now those are 24 feet um, long pilings that sit up about eight feet above the ground and go 16 feet down into the sand. And there's 52 pilings, going the ones that are on the porch support. So the porch deck is attached all the way down into the ground, 16 feet. And the porch roof on the second level is attached with another 24 foot piling, eight by eight inch piling that's bolted to the one coming up out of the ground that comes up about eight feet. So this dome was built in 98. The original Beach Dome 1 um, was moved in 96. So here's Beach Dome 2, built in 98. That's 24 years ago, 23, 24 years ago. Gone through several, many hurricanes uh, with no damage. It's there. The top of the cupola is 52 feet above the ground that you see right in front of the dome there, or it's really it's the street side of the dome. Um, you'll see a road that's coming along there on the left-hand side. <clears throat> in actuality, that road is an abandoned road uh, down where the, the L shape is, is in the road. So uh, that's not really there. Um, this is under construction. Uh, Tanner's got a fit picture of the ocean side. Um, there's the ocean side view after the dome was completed. And like I said, it's... Uh, the hurricane, hurricanes that have come through haven't touched the roof on the deck because it's bolted together all the way down into the ground. Uh, the extension on the other side, on the right-hand side, has the bedroom on each level. Um, there's the, the backside. You can see this three-story extension. We've got a deck that faces, faces the inland waterway. The cupola roof has an overhang of two feet. That's all bolted into the structure of the dome. So. The dome is your protection. In the earlier dome, when my uh, late wife Janet and I went back down there and we went inside of the dome and saw Beach Dome 1 from the inside, um, her comment was, once we saw that the TV was still sitting on the, on the shelf up on the second level, and on one of the bedrooms, that bedroom that you saw cantilevered off the... Uh, the uh, right-hand side, um, that one had a bookshelf going around, a book ledge, and the books were still on the book ledge. And her comment was, wouldn't it have been nice 
wouldn't have been wonderful to ride out the hurricane up in the cupola. Well, it would have been if you knew that in, in advance, it wasn't going to do anything to the dome. Um, so hurricane wise, um, we know how to design. We've got other hold down brackets, a lot of strap ties, uh, stainless steel stuff. If you're on the beach or on the water uh, on an island, that's what we go to. And uh, material wise, we're looking at whatever materials are going to work in that seacoast application. But structurally, the dome is engineered by our engineer, as he did uh, Beach Dome 2. Beach Dome 1, we sort of built, and it lacked uh, the pilings were the problem. That's, that was the whole problem. So hopefully that answers your question from the islands down in the southeast. Yeah, probably, probably pretty important question down there. Yeah. Okay. About the next one here, we have uh, Dan from Eagle River, Alaska. Um, he has questions about the software available to generate elevations, floor pans, acceptable ranges for out of plumb exterior walls, ways to correct out of plumb exterior walls. So sounds like um, he's a bit of an experienced builder. <laughs> Sure, sure. It, yeah, as far as uh, the current software available to generate elevations, there's a, a ridiculous amount of software available now, ranging from free uh, software that you can download that does some basic stuff all the way up to uh, Autodesk, which is AutoCAD and some high-end professional level software. Um, so to generate elevations, however, you know, the, the trick is just getting the grid work so that you can insert that without having to recalculate it all out. But other words, even the free software will do that for you. Um, as far as the acceptable ranges for out of plumb exterior walls, I assume by that you mean the riser walls that the dome sits on, which are the vertical walls that the dome itself usually comes down on to give you a little height on the upper floor. Um, I don't know what I'd say is an acceptable range for being out of plumb. Um, you don't really ever want it out of plumb, but you know, the dome's going to hold itself together for the most part. So depending on where these walls are out of plumb, if there's an extension opening and the dome looks like it's bowing out, there should have been a wall to provide some kind of a sheer, um, some sheer strength there for where the opening is. So if there's not a wall there or anything to support that corner, that could be something that could be utilized to maybe prevent it from bowing out more if it's continuing to get worse. Um, it could have just gotten out of plumb when the dome was built originally, because oftentimes people put up all the riser walls and just build the dome on it without leveling them and making sure they're braced while they build the dome. And sometimes when they're all done, it's a little bit out of plumb. And by that point, it's hard to adjust because you have all the weight of the dome, everything's together. So as far as uh, ways to correct the plumb exterior walls, um, it's really going to be very difficult to almost impossible to do that. Probably your better option is to just reinforce those areas where it might be a problem. Um, have you had anybody successfully like uh, pull a dome to plumb up those walls, Dennis, in the past? Or have you have you heard anybody that's had any luck with that? Because it seems like once that dome's all together, it's gonna be really tough to be able to move it here. We're just talking about the hurricanes, <laughs> the hurricane forces it takes to be able to do do something to these. So, um, no, uh, it, it's really a situation where we we tried that with the garage dome that we built, which now is one of our shop domes, uh, in 1984, and we had a very uh, heavy duty come along uh, and cable to try to pull the one corner in from the. We all had a 16 foot garage door opening in the dome. And we didn't brace it while we were building it. Um, that was 84. So we learned our lessons on that one. Uh, we couldn't pull it back into shape. So we left it. Now there's a wing wall that sticks out. And this is all part of the plan that we have in all of our domes. We take care of this, having learned back in the 70s and 80s. Um, so that's not a problem in building our dome if you follow the directions which is brace the riser wall down to the ground or the inside while you're building, and then add these extensions on. And we have special connections, strap ties, 
that go from the corner of the dome out two feet into the structure of the extension wing wall, we'll call it, either a connection or a eyebrow or whatever it is. So that's all in the plan of things. If you're saying you have an existing dome and it's out of plumb, um, cover it up on the outside if you don't like it being out of plumb. But if it's out of plumb, that just means it's not going anywhere if you've braced it already in the corners. And uh, it's a big deal. Um, the dome is all angles. It kind of comes in and or curves in a little bit. So it kind of fits into the rest of the dome to a certain extent if you've got an existing dome that was built that way. So. All right, uh, Dan, I believe you're here. Does that answer your question? Uh, kind of, I'm not sure where you would brace a dome. It's mainly out of a structural um, thing. If it's going to affect the dome at all, if you'd even mess with it, I believe I've, you know, at worst, it's about five eighths out of out of plumb and four feet. So you've got an existing dome that's out of plumb, is what you're saying? Yes, this dome was built in '83, and uh, we're renovating it. Sure. Yeah, it's it's uh, you're fighting a lot, and uh, you brace it in the corners where the opening is. If the dome is, is tilted out um, in the normal course of the dome sections going around the base, we call the riser wall, there's, that's a pretty weak connection that you've got. I'm not sure what you have for a manufacturer on that. Um, so if that was where it was in 1984, I doubt that you're gonna be able to get that back into shape. And like I said, I don't know that it's really a matter that you have to. If it's an edge of an opening, there are ways, and we can show you some design details that you could use to keep the wall where it is by building a shear wall coming out at, not narrow, necessarily 90 degrees from that corner, but coming out uh, to, to brace that corner down to the ground to a foundation. So uh, that's the standard detail that we use on uh, pier footings. Uh, and when you got a concrete slab, we have concrete going out underneath that wing walls that we have. Understood, thanks. Okay. Awesome. <clears throat> okay, so next question is from uh, Bradley and Joan Rogers from Illinois. Um, so they, uh, I know certain municipalities in the area require guttering on houses. How or gutters, gutters handled in a dome. Dennis? Uh, there you can see uh, our gutters, which have some leaves in them during the fall, um, right at the bottom of the triangles uh, is the perfect spot for it. Uh, the one on the right-hand side, we've got a, I won't explain it uh, well, but it's a double level dome. It slopes down the hillside. It's a low profile on the uphill side. Anyway, this is a, gutter right at the bottom of those triangles over that door and window. And you see the downspout that's kind of tucked into the edge of that triangle coming across, coming down, uh, and a um, downspout and a water runoff. On the left-hand one, you can see a close-up of that corner. And actually we added drain tile. Uh, we've got a 30-foot uh, drop to uh, of creek and we're controlling that water so it uh, doesn't, it was eroding part of a hill in one area. So we did some control by running the lines out further from the dome. But there you see again, another gutter below the windows right there on that particular uh, picture on the left. So it's very easy to put them on the standard gutters. Uh, plastic ones are better because you can cut them at an angle, but they're held back just like a regular gutter is with strap ties to the surface of, uh, of the dome under the shingles. So okay. that's it. Awesome. Yeah, it looks pretty, seems pretty simple. Uh, let's see, moving on to the next one. We have Claire from Ontario, Canada, uh, asking, is there any place in Ontario that makes dome homes? Um, 
So I actually didn't really look into that too much, but there is, I know there's a Canadian monolithic dome manufacturer. I don't, I haven't heard any feedback from them, know if they make good domes or not. Um, there's a call, there's a glamping manufacturer, um, but for geodesic domes, I didn't notice anybody. And even the monolithic dome company was not in Ontario. Um, we do ship to Canada. We have a lot of domes in Canada, so we're able to provide domes in Canada, but I don't, I didn't find anybody in my initial search. Um, and I definitely haven't heard of any manufacturers in um, Canada uh, for geodesic dome homes. So my initial thoughts are there aren't, there could be, there's a lot of dome companies that have come and gone over the years. Um, but yeah, nothing I've heard of. How about you, Dennis? You probably know better than I would, but I didn't, I couldn't see anything. So yeah, no, there were a couple up in Canada, different areas. There was a guy doing domes, uh, big domes over in Saskatchewan. Uh, we've got domes all across uh, Ontario. Um, we can give you some uh, contacts of these dome owners that would be happy to show you uh, their domes. We've got some lists you can write, email us, and we can uh, talk to you. But shipping into Canada from uh, Minnesota is uh, no problem at all. Um, going over to Ontario, it'd ship either into Thunder Bay area or go around Lake Michigan and up through uh, wherever it is over there that you want to come into. So, and uh, it's standard shipping, it's 53 foot semi truck. So from that standpoint, um, we're, yeah, we're pitching our, our <laughs> product here to go into Canada, but uh, yeah, if there, if there were some dome companies would tell you, but uh, these days there aren't. Thank you guys. Uh, move on to the next question we have. Um, from Jeff Hankins in Kansas. Looks like we get this question every so often. Um, do you have any recommendations for insurance companies that'll work with DIY dome builders that, that are receptive, receptive and uh, preferably affordable? Well, Jeff is building one of our domes down in Kansas. And this is a picture of a dome on, um, I think it's White Bear Avenue. Well, it's Highway 96 in St. Paul, uh, north of uh, St. Paul in the suburb. And it houses an insurance company. It's one of our domes. They bought a defunct um, uh, restaurant and turned it into their office space. And it's uh, McNamara Insurance. They are registered in 40 some states. And they're really the answer. They have been uh, insuring domes, not just our dome, but our but domes out there. Um, I gotta say it's been at least 15 or 20 years since we uh, first saw them and switched over to them. Actually, yeah, it's been a, probably that um, at least 20 years. Um, they've got a good staff. Domes don't phase them at all. They are a broker, so they handle all the name brand or can shop the name brand insurance companies that are out there. Uh, you'll get a reasonable rate because you got somebody that knows domes. They're lived in one. I mean, they've worked in one. Uh, they haven't had um, hardly any problems at all that I've heard of in their dome. So it's made a good impression on them. So that's who we recommend in other states. Uh, we are about to do uh, a, a repeat of our survey that we did back in 2012 or something, 10 years ago, um, to existing dome company, uh, dome customers on our list of domes that we have. So um, that'll happen. And one of the questions is who's insuring your dome? So we'll have an updated list here, um, should be within a few months. But right now, uh, I think Kansas is one of the states, Jeff, that uh, insures domes. Um, and you can talk to anybody at McNamara Insurance in St. Paul. We can give you the phone number and contact email. Alicia, Alicia is the one that we deal with, Alicia McNamara. It's a large firm, they got a lot of people. 
Awesome. Okay. Uh, next question here. Uh, I'm probably going to butcher the name. Jo Georges, Georges um, from Ontario, Canada. Uh, the question is, I would like to master the construction dome process. Um, this is a plug for dome school here, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was just going to say is uh, we do offer dome school. Um, normally it's twice a year. This year we're only initially committing to this one time and it's uh, June 9th, 10th and 11th. And at dome school, we actually build part of the dome. Uh, we go over all kinds of aspects of it. If you wanted to build your own components, um, we go over everything from, you can see the transit here in the foreground. So from finding your, the points for your foundation to, um, we have a roofer come and do a roofing section. We install skylight insulation into your panel. We try to cover a little bit of everything so that even if you don't build your own dome, if you're going to hire people to do it for you, you have a little bit of an idea of how things go together. You can communicate better with your contractor. Um, and some people will come with their contractors as well so that they're able to um, have their contractors learn a little bit about the dome and maybe even give them a better estimate or bid because they'll understand more of what's involved in building the dome, uh, see how quickly this part of it goes up. Um, but yeah, that's probably the, the biggest bang for your buck because it's just a few days and you really do learn a lot um, on you know putting the dome together. As far as being a master builder in general, though, it's not going to do that. There's a lot of details when you build a house that um, need to be taken into account. So this is just kind of a good opportunity to say, Here's how our dome system goes up and show you the basics. And then, um, but obviously if you're doing this yourself, there's a lot of other things involved um, like electrical and foundation work and plumbing and different stuff that you'd have to educate yourself on unless you hired it out. So, but yeah, this is definitely the best, uh, I think the best investment for learning how to build a dome in a short amount of time without a lot of cost. And there's a lot of good food too. So, you know, you get to, you get to eat while you're here. So um Aaron was just here last year at our at our dome school so I don't I don't know if you can attest to that but <laughs> it, it was a lot of fun and it was also awesome to use it as an experience to have a dome tour if you haven't seen a dome before and you just kind of have this idea of what a dome is and they have some beautiful domes there so it's a really good place to 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 go and to meet all kinds of cool people yeah yeah absolutely cool Okay, so next one we have from uh, Phyllis in Washington. Um, she says, my garage would be attached to my dome by a laundry room and mudroom in one of the extensions. Uh, the garage will be built before the dome so that she has a place to store the dome materials. And uh, she's wondering about the order of like pouring the foundations. Um, she can just do the garage um, but the, any of the extension at the same time, or is it better to do it all at the same time? Uh, what do you guys think, Dennis? Yeah, I talked this over with uh, Derek and we looked at it from the standpoint that the garage, um, if you're, if you're not heating it, and I'm looking at this being in uh, Centralia, Washington that she's talking about, so from that standpoint, um, the garage would be better off poured separately. So you've got a separation between the garage slab and the house slab from a thermal break. So it would lend itself well to that. Um, it's a little problematic if you've got a, a basement underneath the house, but not the garage. But if it's on the same level, it's slab on grade, then... Um, now, my, here's one that's uh, poured the same level. This is out in the Black Hills. So you'll see the garage right next to the house. Um, this one was done in one pour. Um, but really, uh, <laughs> because the garage is heated and there's a whole bedroom uh, complex upstairs of the garage. So with that, we wanted the, the garage slab to have PEX tubing in it. And uh, you might still want to do that where you are in Washington. So that would mean you'd want to have some kind of connection through that. You don't have to, but um, you could do that. So it's, it's a situation where your land is part of it, 
the method of supporting that garage slab right at the joint to the house is minor. It's standard thickened edge slab for the garage. But uh, for the most part, I'd say don't join it because you're going to build it later. You can add uh, rebar sticking out by fiberglass rebar and you won't have any rust on it. And you can add, provide the connection structurally that way to the slab so they don't separate or settle differentially. Excellent. And uh, looks like uh, the person asked the question might be here. Does that uh, answer your question? I guess David is on the phone. Yes, it does. That was uh, Phyllis and David. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, moving along here. Um, should be a quick one. We have uh, Thomas from Hudson, Wisconsin. Uh, what construction What construction companies do you recommend? Do any of these companies do loans? Looking to build in Minnesota or Western Wisconsin? Yeah, so we um, actually, Minnesota and Wisconsin happens to be where Dan Newcomb of Newcomb Interiors, Exteriors happens to work. Um, that would be my recommendation. Um, he is, I can't think of a better person to build domes. I mean, not only is he a great person, very fair with pricing, but that's all he's done for what, Dennis, maybe 20 years now. He's been pretty much exclusively working on domes, re-roofing domes, um, remodeling domes. He's built a few from the ground up. Um, great guy. I would give you his website address, but he actually doesn't have one. <laughs> Probably because he can, he, he has a hard time keeping up with the demand. And you find somebody that can do a great job and is very fairly priced and they have no uh, difficulty finding work. But he, uh, he would be my recommendation and he does work in both, he's licensed both in Wisconsin and Minnesota. So he would be the guy I'd recommend. As far as um, construction companies doing loans, typically they're not in the lending business. So they're going to want loan secured through a bank or a third party. <clears throat> I haven't heard of any, you know, construction companies that will do their own in-house lending. There may be one or two, but um, but you shouldn't have a problem getting a construction loan through, you know, any conventional means. Uh, any bank out there should typically do that. Um, and again, that might be something that'll be helpful when, when we are able to compile all that information on where people what banks they went through to get their construction loans, um, what they went through for their insurance, different different things like that. But I mean, when you look at the last one, Dennis, it kind of is <clears throat> all encompassing. You had a bunch from Wells Fargo, several different banks that will do construction loans. Um, but yeah, I would say Dan Newcomb of Newcomb Exteriors. And if you are interested or you want to know more, I can definitely get you his phone number, contact information so that you can reach out to him. But he's able to do Wisconsin and Minnesota, and sometimes he will be willing to travel uh, to do like re-roofing or some, some smaller remodel projects. I mean, fairly good sized projects, not small, small, but <clears throat> he'll, he'll do things besides a full brand new dome, I guess is what I should say. <clears throat> so... And yes, it still surprises me too, Dennis. He actually doesn't have a website. <laughs> I was like, like what? So he's, that, that is funny. <laughs> it, yeah. he's, our, he's our roofer that comes for the dome school over here. And he always brings his daughter. And I keep after his daughter. And he's, okay. I said, get on your dad's computer and send me all his photos he has of all these roofs that he's done. Because mm -hmm. uh, Dan has never done that to us. And I don't know that he wants to, uh, I think he knows how to run his computer, but he's just uh, not into the computer. So that's it. No. All right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> next question here from uh, Michael Wells, all the way up in Nova Scotia, Canada. Um, with regards right, to- They answered my question. Cool. No, they recommended, oh my. Oh, I think I just want to mute there. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Uh, start over here. Uh, with regards to a completed dome shell, including the cladding and fenestrations, which I think otherwise known to be like sheathing and doors and windows, uh, and with a maximum snow load, is there any consideration given to the lowest section of struts for structural integrity? And what is the difference in relative load on these lower struts as compared to the struts higher up on the structure? 
Um, and then the quick little second question in there is, are there any other options for dome cladding? Regarding the structure of the dome, the dome transfers the load in our system, in our natural spaces dome system, the structural load coming down from snow load is transferred down the struts to the corners of the riser wall. And up on the top where you have the load, here's our small, uh, <laughs> you can't even see it in the, this winter. This is our small uh, 30 foot diameter dome and it's transferred its load down on that little bit of the top down through the struts. At about a 45 degree line, you don't have much snow load at 60 degrees um, down from that, there's no snow load. So a third, over a third of that dome has no snow load on it uh, on the lower part. And the upper part, uh, it's very little because it's tapered down. You, don't, you can't load the dome just straight down with snow. It's at an angle. And because it's a dome and the shape that it has, usually without a, extensions like you see in front of you, and you saw just a dome, that wind is going to blow a lot of snow off of it. Now this one uh, is protected where we live in a forest here with oak trees and pine trees. So we don't get a lot of wind that's whipping the snow off of our dome. But there you see at least uh, 16 inches, maybe 18 inches of snow on top all the way along. And we've had that this winter. Um, so what would you what would you do from the standpoint of saying, okay, if it transfers it down, why are you creating a larger structural piece down at the bottom? It transfers it down the piece and it's not got a side load on it. It's got a vertical load on it. Uh, here's our large dome that I'm in right here. That uh, picture is Derek up on the top of the cupola. Um, getting the snow off of the satellite dish. Um, we've got, again, about 18 inches of snow on the whole entire dome. Down below, on the right-hand side, between the tree and the dome, you can see the shingles mm -hmm. along there. So you notice there's really no load. Yes, there was some ice and sticky snow that was there, but once you got to that 60-degree vertical from vertical, there's no snow. So the load isn't compounded like that. And the roof load above it is very small. And it's all transferred down through the struts to the corners. And that takes care of it. On a 74 foot diameter dome, uh, our engineer has looked at that in the heavy snow load region. And he still is questioning. And he, he said, well, maybe we could change the struts. And I said, what for? Well, he started to look at it and there's no, if the strut is horizontal, there's no load coming down on it. Um, the load's transferred down the struts. We've got three by three inch, well, it's two and a half inch by 10 inch, number one dug fur strut material. We have that if it was needed. We haven't needed it. The only place that that's called for is a horizontal plate on the ground, uh, not the ground, but on top of the slab uh, for the, the riser wall, the bottom of the riser wall, because he wants that there in an earthquake zone uh, for racking strength. As compared to a normal inch and a half thick plate, it's a two and a half inch thick plate. So that can be bolted down with our standard brackets that we do for hold down brackets. So there's no need for. Uh, any consideration of changing the struts at the lower part of the dome. As far as the cladding on the dome, I'm going to say 95% of our domes are done with asphalt shingles. And at the moment, we recommend uh, the company name is their family name, Malarkey Legacy Shingles. They really are superior um, timberline domes, GAF timberline shingles, not timberline domes, timberline shingles are, have lost uh, some of their quality. And this has gotten back to us from uh, Dan, our roofer. Uh, he said they seem to be a little thinner. Um, 
Duration is another uh, shingle that's out there for Owen Scorning. If you're going to shingle your dome with asphalt shingles, you want to spend some money on the shingles. Three tab shingles, which are the cheap shingles that are out there, one layer, they're called three tab shingles, don't work on a dome because the wind can, as it breaks over that edge of the panel, the wind can lift up that, that uh, tab, one of the outside tabs. The shingle that we're using comes over the joint line six inches and we nail it down and the wind doesn't do anything to it at all. Um, it's a very pliable shingle. It's a modified asphalt, uh, they say SBS. Um, so it's a modified asphalt shingle. That's what we use almost exclusively. Cedar shakes are an option. There's a question later on about that and we can talk about that. Um, elastomeric roof coatings will work, but in dry, warmer climate zones. That's what we've learned. That's our experience. I wouldn't recommend them in a heavy snow load region. Uh, we they had some problems at the dome in Helsinki with a seven layer coating of uh, elastomerics. And um, it just showed us that it's not a good material when you're dealing with snow and ice. <clears throat> Wet climate zone, it takes multiple layers, like seven layers with the base and the, the intermediate coats and things, and it needs dry time. And that's problematic in a wet zone. So out in the Southwest US, it would work. And we have some domes. It's dome in Lyons, Colorado, um, above uh, Boulder. And that one been uh, done since uh, 1983. You have to recoat them after so many years, but it's just a top layer of uh, elastomeric. We do have Reinke aluminum shakes as one of the options. And we've used that quite a few times, several dozen domes. Pardon? <laughs> Tessa says her favorite. Uh, here you see their, their gray uh, shingle on our shop dome on the right-hand side of it. We recently reshingled the left-hand side, which had, uh, believe it or not, 1980 shingles on it. Um, here's the beach dome one, there's shingles on it, back to this dome. Um, so one of the things I should mention, the left-hand side of the dome has an additional two inches of styrofoam cut into triangles with a layer of half-inch plywood above it to increase the energy efficiency of this particular dome that was built in 1980, as I said. So here's, uh, here's Dan the roofer and his crew up on top. You see the styrofoam two inches thick and the half inch plywood on top of it screwed down through the two inch of foam down into the struts. So the shingles are nailed to that roofing plywood. And that's what we've got. And it really helped increase um, the energy efficiency this year of the dome. It was built in, like I said, 1980, where or I'm closer to 79. And we just thought it's a garage. That's what it was at the time. So we didn't do anything. And then we turned it into a shop. It's got six inches of fiberglass and that's not enough. But from a shop standpoint, it's been very comfortable, very easy to heat. Uh, we've got an outside wood fired boiler that heats both the shop domes and the, the office dome and the uh, old house, we call it the forest dome, um, and the guest house attached to it. So it's heating five domes from an outside wood fired boiler e very effectively. Okay. All right. Nice. That's cool. Nice. <clears throat> okay. The uh, so next one we have is uh, Thomas from Illinois. Um, the super wall uh, pre-cut dome shell kit. Uh, his questions were, um, is there anything else needed to complete the dome when you have the kit? And is the kit based on my initial plan if chosen from the existing plans? Um, uh, so I'll start with, with the, the second part of that question. The kit is based on your plans. Um, once your plans are designed, then your kit would 
would be customized to your plans, depending on how many extension openings you have. If you have a cupola, um, you know, one or two story extensions dictate how much is removed from the original dome shell kit. So if you look at our dome shell kit page on our website and you'll see prices, um, the more openings you put in the dome, the more components are removed from our kit and therefore the price goes down. So, so yeah, it does get kind of customized based on your, your plan rather as chosen from one of our existing plans or you start with a new one. Um, as far as the first part of the question, uh, if what is needed to complete the dome, um, quite a bit. So the dome shell kit essentially provides you the dome components that you're not going to easily find or manufacture yourself that um, you are able to build a dome with but you're still gonna need roofing, which we can provide, windows and doors, which we can provide, countertops, bath fixtures, flooring, uh, you know, a second floor system, if you're gonna do a second floor. So there's still a lot that is involved in completing the entire project. What we try to do is provide the components that are gonna be hard for you to locally source or that are gonna require certain manufacturing techniques that might be difficult for some people to do with the angles and different things. And of course, our hardware system, which you can only find um, through us. So that's really what we provide. But yeah, there's a lot of other, a lot of, you know, the, the whole electrical system and the plumbing system and HVAC. <laughs> so there's a lot that goes into building a house. Um, we do provide certain parts of it. Like I said, we provide roofing, doors, windows, uh, of course, the, the triangle skylights. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot more in addition to all that stuff. So are you there, Thomas? Do you want to, did you, is that kind of what you're wondering about as far as what's included in the kit? So on this page, it does give you a breakdown of uh, everything that is included in the kit. So that will kind of tell you what you get for the pricing below. And then if you go through our website and you go to the dome store page on our website, you can scroll down and Anything that we offer through our, our company, or, or at least 95% of everything we offer is listed there with pricing. Um, so you can look at uh, a lot of different things. If you want to add a cupola, there's triangle skylights, uh, roofing materials, like I said. Uh, so a lot of things we do offer and we can include with your shipment, we do offer on there. But the dome shell kit is simply the, the framing and the exterior plywood the risers, you know, everything to kind of get that initial dome frame shell, I guess, up. And then and then beyond that, it's it's additional. So it's yeah, a good question that, for everyone who's just getting into this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And houses, you know, they're it, you know, I don't ever want to scare people with it, but there's a lot involved with building a home. So there's a lot of different components. Um, and a lot of different steps. So, and and Dennis has set set up natural spaces where we offer a connection kit, a connection hardware kit. If you wanted to build your own struts and panels, all the way up until we're for some people that live in Hawaii, where it's real expensive to buy stuff. You know, we've even included um, flooring and different things for for people in remote locations. So. We can try to do as, as little or as much as you need based on your budget and um, you know the time you want to put into the project. So, but but yeah, if you go to our website, as you can see here, Tanner's kind of scrolling through, just showing you some of the things we offer, or like the foundation systems. We don't necessarily offer a lot of what was shown, but we do talk about it a little bit just so you can get a, a quick snapshot of understanding of what's involved if you want to do certain certain. Uh, you know, foundation types and stuff. So, but yeah, yeah, hopefully that kind of helps. We also have uh, insulation and interior triangle panels, one piece interior triangle panels. That's what you're seeing and in the dome or in the uh, other dome in the back of Derek and the dome in the back of Aaron, which is our dome. It's a virtual background he's put in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> have to admit that. <laughs> someday it'll be a, a real dub right don't worry, don't worry. Right. <laughs> okay all right um next question here we have from alessandro in spain um, i am a designer of 
feng shui and I have participated in the construction of domes and other natural constructions like houses, gardens, and such. Uh, would you like to do any collaboration in Spain and Italy? Derek? Yeah, I mean, you know, we we always like to help people with their dome projects and, and collaboration is 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 part of that we have sent some domes in fact didn't you say earlier dennis that you went to one of the dome sites in spain yeah earlier so yeah, yeah. We, we we have done some projects over there so that would be something you know we could kind of talk about and and see exactly what you had in mind but yeah there's a lot of people that have been building you know domes for different projects other than homes a lot of rental domes uh you know different things like that so um but yeah, yeah, that would be something. Dennis would be a good one to talk to too, since he's been there. He could probably even tell you where and who he's worked with and kind of get the ball rolling maybe. So, <laughs> Well, the dome that, that we were at uh, in, in uh, 2000 is in Zaragoza, just outside of the town of Zaragoza, northeast of Madrid, between Madrid and Barcelona. Um, the people that built the dome, um, the owner was an American working in Spain, and he hired the local soccer team <laughs> to construct the dome. And uh, the young men really loved climbing around and building the structure from the, from the ground up, worked very well for him. Um, but we've got domes right now that we shipped a dome over to Italy uh, to a couple who actually are from Bulgaria and are about to um, go to Bulgaria and build their dome back. That's where they're from. Um, this dome in front of you right now on the screen is up north of the Arctic Circle on a small island, uh, actually a large island off of Bodo, or Bodo as they say, north of the Arctic Circle in Norway. Um, Romania has domes. Uh, there should be, I don't know if the dome in Latvia has been built yet, um, so we've got a bunch of domes all over the place, Tokyo, uh, area or not Tokyo, but I mean, Japan and the Northern Island and then, uh, Chile, four domes on Cyprus. So we ship them all over. We consult with you. And, uh, if you want to build domes, um, you can buy our connector kit. If you are looking to build as a builder and make your own components. So that's an option too. So. Yeah. Awesome. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's see. Moving on to Barbara Wilson in Illinois as well. Uh, we have a dome built in 1991. We're going to re-roof with cedar shakes and wonder if there is any reason to use asphalt art architectural shingles other than the cost. Well, you need my my recommendation is that you need somebody if you're going to do a cedar shake roof that's done more than a i'll call it a typical pitched roof uh, mono pitched roof on a conventional house you want somebody that's done dormers that's done a, a shapes or something with experience and you want to go back to them and ask for recommendations of who they worked on and what problems they might have. The dome on your upper right is a dome up in Northern Wisconsin where we had um, Peter who was working for us. He knew how to do cedar shakes. And we've probably got a couple dozen domes that were done with cedar shakes, phenomenal detailing, uh, expert, uh, all for all parts of the dome. So Peter really had a good uh, a good run of it for a couple of years there, two three years, and um, then he met a woman, and they moved on and bought a motel somewhere, <laughs> changed his profession. So cedar shakes are need to have an underlayment. They've got to have an ice and water shield underlayment on them. They should have an interlayer to them. Um, they are pricey, but uh, as an option, Reinke shakes are basically an imitation metal shingle. But 
I agree, they don't aesthetically uh, offer the same um, romance that cedar shakes have, but you need to have someone who's experienced and you need to check on their references. That's, that's a critical part of it. So yes, from the standpoint of asphalt shingles, um, that's why people choose asphalt shingles because the expertise is there from a local roofer following direction. And I think on the website, we also sell a roofing manual too that uh, quite handy for anyone You're trying right. to roof a dome. Yeah. yeah, you can order that separately. It's part of our construction manual, but you can order that separately uh, off the website. It's $30 and it uh, um, shows you all the differences in uh, two frequency, three frequency and four frequency domes for how you should rip it and the sequence of how you should rip it. Okay, so moving on to a question that's uh, really common, which is uh, from Michael in Wakefield. Uh, how much does it cost to build a dome? Well, here's my standard answer to those uh, you have that haven't heard it. Um, yes, we have this dome home construction cost guide on there. But when you ask the question, how much it costs to build a dome home? My answer back to, to you is, um, I'll tell you how much it costs to build a dome home if you'll tell me how much the Ford F-150 costs. It's the same difference. You can buy a Ford F-150 in that probably $30,000 range. Um, but you can also buy the Ford F-150, the new one coming out, hundred and some thousand dollars, hundred and ten thousand dollars with all the options. So we try to show you this with this cost guide that we have. <clears throat> Plug in the square footage, including the basement. If you're building a basement and your upper floor and your cupola. So throw all that square footage in here you got a 2,500 square foot dome. Are you building it by a contractor or you're helping the contractor or your owner building it uh, or is a quality level A, B, or C or quantity, quantity level A, B, and C? And that's a range. So um, we can help guide you through that, but we're trying to um, get some Get, give you some idea of what it could cost completed without the land, but there it is completed. So go to that for a quick guide, and then you come back to us and say, how come it costs so much? And we can show you that the forty, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 dome package or $100,000 dome package is part of what you're going to be building. So... There really is no answer. Uh, there is a dome for sale. It might technically be off the market, but it's still for sale down in the Texas Hill Country. Um, it's only 8,000 square feet and three domes, and it's a million and a half. So that's what he's asking. That's yeah. what it's worth, I should say. Sure. All right. Okay, next one here. We have Roy in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, how long does it take to build a dome start to finish? Derek? So that's a, that's a similar uh, answer to that, a similar question, I guess, is really depends on the expertise of the crew, how many are on the crew, the size of the dome, complexity of the project. Um, so again, I'll kind of go back to a question I answered a little bit earlier where I would say it, it's going to be about the same as a custom home um certain aspects will definitely go faster again if you buy the dome kit you save huge amounts of time getting the structure up uh some parts will go a little slower just because of the uniqueness of the dome um but yeah that's kind of an open-ended question as well because there's just so many variables that would dictate how you would even narrow the focus on that but but think, think of any you know and by custom home i guess really what i mean is it's just not part of a big development where they there's four different uh, models that they're building 300 of them and those go up pretty fast 
Um, I just mean anybody that's building their own unique home, conventional or otherwise. Um, you know, you could think of a dome as being kind of on par with that on how much time it takes. And and so if you've ever seen anybody, a neighbor building a house, uh, you know, you can kind of gauge it based on that. If they had, you know, obviously big crews of experienced builders can go really fast with even big projects, but small crews that aren't that experienced building a small, smaller, more conservative home can also build it pretty quickly. So, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, not a, not a, not an easy one to answer, I guess, but hopefully that helps a little bit. Maybe not. <laughs> so. Well, um, I guess we'll move on to the next question here uh, to Peter from New Jersey. Uh, would central vac system, sorry, central vacuuming, I'll say it out there, I guess, uh, systems work in a dome? And also, how about central air via conventional forced air duct work? Derek? Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, Peter, it, you know, it's interesting with domes. I think people oftentimes think that you need specialized components or parts when it comes to, you know, plumbing, electrical, HVAC. Um, but really, all those things uh, are all going to be your standard, um, you know, it's going to be installed the same way. It's going to be the same components you're going to buy anywhere. So, so yes, I guess the short answer is yes, all those things will work. In fact, Dennis was brought up a story earlier that he he spoke to a woman who who had a dome and she said that she had her central uh, vacuuming system kind of centrally located. And she commented on how great it worked because she was able to kind of have it in the middle of her dome and reach all of her rooms just from that one port. Um, so, so in that case, it might even work better in a dome. But typically you can think of anything um, in a conventional house would translate equally into a dome. There's not going to be any kind of specialized uh, equipment or anything like that needed. All your hot water systems and your heating and cooling systems and your foundation systems, um, all those things are still going to, going to be the same, same materials and same, same components. So yeah, nothing special about a dome as far as that goes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, you're looking at a, uh, a system here in a crawl space. And this crawl space is totally insulated and sealed. So you don't have any ground moisture coming up. Um, also notice that it's a, a photo of a screenshot. <laughs> this isn't a screenshot on my computer. It's a photo from my iPhone of my Mac computer. Cause I noticed the Drifters song, White Christmas uh, noted on my bottom of my screen there. Uh, but you see the, the ductwork and the tubing for this air handling system in the crawl space. If you're going to do forced air, this may be the easiest way to do it. You put in a four foot high crawl space, it's lighted, it's sealed. Um, it's, you can see it's a professional interior space. This costs some dollars. So you can't exclude this from, uh, from the building standpoint. You don't build a concrete slab, you're building a wood floor, but the, the floor below it in the crawl space, we did in our small dome, and it's a two and a half inch thick uh, concrete slab. So um, we do radiant floor heating a lot these days in cold climate zones. Um, you're building in New Jersey, uh, Peter, so that's probably a recommendation that I'd make. We love it. It's Tessa's big, big point here with this space is the radiant floor heating, right? Yep, that's what she says. She does her exercising on the floor, on a mat, sometimes not on a mat. And uh, at, at the end of that, uh, takes a nap. <laughs> we, yeah, we, warm floor, you know? We have, we have radiant heating uh, on an addition we put in our house and we, Kind of got addicted to it, so. Yes, if you're, I'm addicted to for sure. This is the radiant floor heating here uh, in, in our, uh, we call it Bear Creek Dome. It's the 49 foot diameter dome. So this shows you five different zones. They're colored. This is designed by our heating guy, uh, Keith Kelly. Um, he, so he does these layouts for us. And the longest, uh, zone is 305 lineal feet of tubing. 
the shortest zone is 295 lineal feet of tubing. So it doesn't vary by more than 10 degrees, 10 feet. Right. But it also, um, from that standpoint, oh, is only so long so that you don't have so much loss um, going out and coming back. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's part of the uniqueness of the dome that it can be done that way. We, what? Yes. It's a lot less heating costs. Our, our average um, that we did, that we uh, have done for the last 10 years, excluding this year as prices went up, um, is $530. That's our heating bill in Minnesota, where we're in an almost 9,000 heating degree days zone. We're, we're on the border of zone seven. And that's for the entire heating season from October through, as we say, May till we get to Memorial Day and then maybe a little bit after. <laughs> um, we keep it at 71 degrees. The thermostat on the wall doesn't change. When we finally turn it on, we have a mini split system uh, above. Um, it's kind of far up. That gives us some temporary heating. Yeah, I can't tip my computer far enough up to see that. In the master bedroom, there's also a mini split that's got a heat pump system that takes care of September, October, and May and early June um, from, uh, from a standpoint of heating. But when we turn that on, we turn the thermostat, set it at 71 degrees. That's it. We don't change it. We go away for the weekend. We leave it at 71 degrees because if you're heating up a mass and then you're going to allow it to cool down, you have to reheat that mass of concrete back up again. So we've got some really good uh, people, Keith and his crew, designing this system. Uh, we modified it slightly where the master bedroom is on the upper right by saying, wait a minute, we don't want radiant floor heating underneath our bed. So he redesigned that part and, and there's no uh, radiant floor heat tubes underneath our bed. It's very comfortable and you can do that, um, easy to do, but you need a professional design. Don't try to do it yourself. Unless you got some knowledge in that field, then we can give you some pointers on it. Uh, Peter, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Okay, next we have, uh, so everyone knows we have about six questions left uh, for our Dome Talk this month. Uh, let's say Tyler from Michigan. Um, while I understand a treated wood foundation uh, from 1975, I believe. Well, there's a note here. Um, I have an admittedly unfounded reservation against them. Is ICF the only alternative if we want a basement or can block or conventional poured walls be used? Uh, second question, uh, if there is time, uh, sort of related, we have a uh, nine foot ceiling, sorry, is a nine foot ceiling height achievable on the main floor with a full basement? And this is with a 30 or 36 foot high profile dome. Yeah, the, the, um, the nine foot ceiling on the main floor is really unrelated to your basement. Uh, the basement could be nine feet also. We have uh, in our office film a nine and a half foot ceiling in our basement because we are on a hillside and we needed that height to get down low enough on the opposite side, at which point we've got a uh, 25 to 30 foot drop to the creek below. So it's relatively flat on the top. This is the Bear Creek Dome Foundation that we did, which is a treated wood foundation system. And it's a stem wall sitting on a two by 10 plate on P-Rock. That's how we do them. The, the floor that we've got here, um, there's, there's the dirt inside. It gets uh, filled in on both sides of that wall. We've got four inches of foam going vertically. And then it's a frost protected shallow footing where we extend out 18 inches. That equals our frost depth. We then filled that in and poured a concrete slab, a monolithic pour all the way across 2,100 square feet after we put the radiant floor tubing in and the, and the uh, mesh above the radiant floor uh, tubing. 
we have, and our dome is open to look at, we have no cracks in the concrete, zero. So um, here's wood, you know? We have a wood foundation. The, uh, Aaron, the, the remark of 1975 is the fact that the original dome that we have, which we call our forest dome attached to our office, was built in 1975 using treated lumber. You can come and look at that. There's nothing wrong. Nothing's happened to it. Um, there is one spot where you can see a plate. Uh, there's a crawl space uh, back of a couple of rooms, back of the mechanical room. You can look at the treated lumber. It's the same as it was in 75, which is 47 years ago, 48 years ago. So it's that kind of a situation where, yes, uh, your comment that you're admittedly afraid of a, a treated wood foundation, it's the same lumber that we used back in those days when we did it, and it's the same lumber today. CCA treated, it's not available to the general public, it's not sold in lumber yards. Um, it is pressure treated, so it doesn't leach out. But look at this foundation in front of you. There's four inches of foam, and above that, when it's finished, there's a metal um, flashing that goes over the top of that foam. So there's nothing that's going to leach out as far as the chemicals are concerned. Um, so are there alternatives to a wood foundation? Yeah, the insulated concrete forms. They're great. Um, you know, they will work very well. You can cut them with a hot blade. You can shape them to whatever shape the dome is, whatever lengths you need. There's many different um, uh, brands of these. We've used ARCS, A-R-X-X, -X, uh, quite a few times. I shouldn't say we, but uh, it's been used on our domes quite a few times. The big box stores usually carry a couple of different brands. You need to find a contractor who knows how to build with ICF blocks. Uh, who's done it before? And in, if they done it, did they just do rectangular houses all the time? Or did they do a bay window or a little angle here? Um, so this is, this is all part of it. So um, other foundations, yeah, block, regular old concrete block, but you need to pour those cores. Um, Trying to look and see what uh, uh, yeah, conventional block or conventional poured. And a conventional poured wall is going to cost you, I think, more money than an ICF block wall. And your ICF block wall, you have to insulate. If you did a poured concrete wall, you still have to insulate on the outside. And you're building in Michigan, you want four inches of foam on the outside. That's what you want. So even if you do a concrete uh, ICF block, unit, you might want to add insulation on the outside of that ICF block. ARCS has a system that has four inches on the outside and two inches on the inside. It's the same temperature outside of the exposed block as it is um, to conventional house. Okay. I think we've covered that pretty good. Yeah, I think so, yeah. No. I think so. Thank you for your question, Tyler. Uh, next, we have Kenneth from Midland, Michigan. Uh, the dome is a self-supported structure, allowing great interior walls and floor flexibility. Are there any suggestions on things like movable walls or furniture as walls or changeable floors that take advantage of, of this? Yeah, so I actually talked to Kenneth a little bit about this and um, you know, he's thinking ahead of the curve in a lot of ways. So, so he's 100% correct. The dome does not require any interior load bearing walls to support the dome. Um, unless you're doing some serious modifications to the dome and removing large parts of the structure, but otherwise the dome supports itself without any problems, even with several openings in it. Um, the, the key to being able to move your interior walls and, and create 
uh, like for instance, let's say you want your house to be adaptable. Um, like a lot of people, for instance, when COVID hit, started working from home, they didn't have a in-home office and you wanna have the freedom to be able to, you know, move your interior around to adapt to the situation. You have children that are being born, you have children leaving the house, you're working from home, you're not working from home, different things. You just really have to be able to have the foresight structurally to know where your loads are going to possibly be coming down so you can have foundational support for that. So if you have a second floor and you want to be able to move things around, you just have to have posts in the right spots um, in your lower walls so that if you want to move them around, certain parts are going to have to probably stay there to hold up to second floor. The dome itself wouldn't require that, but... Um, but other words, yeah, if, as long as you can kind of have some foresight and realize that your flexibility might be limited in a couple spots, you can absolutely do something like that and give yourself the ability to uh, to adapt your house to your needs as you age. You know, some people, too, as they get older, they may need additional access for wheelchairs into their bathroom areas and stuff. So if all that is kept in mind as you design your home, um, you can try to give yourself as many options as possible. But the biggest challenge there is just the fact that you're going to have, um, you know, you're going to get, you're going to have to carry your your second floor load down through walls or posts at some point to allow you to uh, support that second floor. So some of those walls may have to stay there if they're supporting the second floor, or those posts may need to remain in place. Um, Tanner just brought up a picture. Here's Dennis being creative with a post that he wanted to have where it is and instead of putting a post in there he kind of incorporated um a tree to essentially create you know not a distracting post but something that looks kind of nice a nice little decorative part and it's got some cool things on there so it's just part of dennis's creative solutions but but you know there's a situation where you know that post does need to be there but it doesn't need to impact your housing you can still work around it in some respects so i don't know I don't know if that kind of answered everything you had there. Um, Kenneth, I know we talked about a little bit before on a on a consultation, so. Right, right. And I, I found a, a, in New York City, the apartments. Yep. They do. They, they have temporary walls going in there and out of there all the time currently and have for years. And so I had a chance to look through some of the ways they do the attachments so that when the tenant leaves, they aren't responsible for repairs to the apartment that was modified for an interior wall. Oh, sure. That's for the tree. I think that's great. I know my cat would love that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's an oak tree. So the building inspector questioned me on what I needed to support it. And I said, it's oak. It's a five inch diameter piece of oak, you know? And he finally uh, had to admit that, okay, that it will carry the load that it, there's a beam that sticks out from that or goes across that. So we actually had to drill, uh, not had to, but we drilled a one inch diameter hole down the center of that uh, through the heartwood of the tree and dropped a um, electric line down there and came out underneath this. Uh, it's Tesla's computer station where she is right now over there uh, on the edge of our large uh, peninsula island for eating. So we've done a lot of changing over at the original dome in 75. We moved in in 75 with my late wife and I, and in 83, we changed the whole inside around. Yes, there were some posts, but we built around it, made that a hallway, made change the dining room, filled in a big open floor area. Because the dome doesn't need any support, it's just the second floor. Now you're talking about a New York apartment, what you wanted, if you wanted a complete versatility, pour a six inch diameter, not diameter, six inch thick structural slab. It'll span a certain distance. So you design it right and you could have 20, 30 feet across, but it'll be a commercial installation of that uh, tied into poured cement walls that are gonna support that six inch structural slab. Then you can have complete versatility underneath that um, second floor space. So your only option there, um, the only object to worry about is the second floor supports. Awesome, thanks for the question, Kenneth. 
Uh, next, we have uh, Joyce Jones from Idaho. Uh, her question is uh, building geodesic dome into a slope and covering it with concrete. Can you do that? And how about preventing mold? Dennis? Well, what you're talking about is monolith monolithic domes. And you can do a monolithic dome. I don't know what they've done as far as putting dirt over that. Um, we had, um, when we sold our, our previous company, which was called The Big Outdoors People, I say we, that was my late wife and I, back in 1978 and formed Natural Spaces Domes. We started out and we went to our engineer and said, here's what we'd like to do, build a wood frame dome and cover it in dirt. So he did the engineering on it and we had to beef up a lot of parts and the lower part of that dome at that point, yes, you'd have to really beef that up structurally to carry that load, to carry the pressure from the dirt. And that's when we came up with, and then when we were doing it for energy efficiency, that was the reason. We also here in Minnesota, this is the heart of underground housing that started here at the Underground Space Center at the University of Minnesota in the late 70s and all during the 80s. Um, we I did 20 conventional houses during the 80s that were earth sheltered houses, not domes, didn't have dirt on the roof. So when we did the analysis for energy efficiency and we created the dome shell where we did 12 inch, 15 inch, 18 inch, 21 inch thick um, domes with a double strut system and then stuffed that full of insulation, it was way above what an earth covered house would do from the standpoint of energy efficiency. And we're living right in our proof right now, like I said, $530 a year for keeping this house as warm as you want it, uh, as an average. It's probably up a little bit from that. We'll find out at the end of the heating season here. When the gas companies raise prices and the electric up a little bit, we have off-peak electric though too. So um, would I say you could do it? Sure, structurally, you could figure out what to do. Should you do it? No. Um, and an example of that was we were over in um, Slovakia, Bratislava, where we have one of our domes over there. And the owner brought us over to some friends of theirs, some architect friends. This is, this is Tessa and I now. <laughs> I jumped from previous life to a new knife. We saw their small uh, dome in their backyard that they had built, and they tucked it three feet into the ground and then built this, this dome structure and covered it in sandbags of dirt as the base. And then we're putting um, soil on top of that. And what we saw was the results of all of that after a rainstorm where the sandbags had slid down and compressed themselves about halfway down and left the top of the dome open. And they were just trying to figure out what they were gonna do, <laughs> how they were gonna do this. So uh, I don't think it's been done successfully. And I have to say, I don't see a reason for it with our current technology of um, insulation that can be done. If you're doing it for aesthetic reasons, that's a different story. Um, but you're gonna have to really reinforce the concrete structure and don't start out with a wood frame, start out with a, a strictly concrete reinforced, steel reinforced or fiberglass, I say fiberglass steel reinforced. This picture of a dome here real quick is down in San Diego. It's a fireproof dome that we created down there after the two domes he had, which were not our domes, burned down in a fire. So we did cement board on the outside, 
with a, uh, there you can see the two dome, well, all of them have the cement board and the joints are filled in. And uh, there's no heavy vegetation around the dome. So that's another feature that we've done. So we can build domes in fire prone areas to make them fireproof. There's no ventilated dome shell in here because that could draw in hot air and, and uh, pieces of um, embers into the structure. So you'll also notice above that window on the left and the one in the middle, that the soffit on that window is slanted so it doesn't allow fire to build up in that corner. So there's a lot of things that we just haven't touched on that we can show you and deal with uh, when we talk to you. We offer consultation services and we'll, we'll work with you on some ideas that you might have. I've been doing it for 50 years. Derek's been into it for longer than he's worked here. And um, we've got some real-time experience here with things that we've tried, a um, variety of things. And we have customers that have tried new things. Solar panels don't work very well in a dome because you don't have enough surface area at one time facing. So it's all these things that we've got samples of that we can really show you at, by example of what to do and what not to do. All right, Chase, thanks for the question. Um, next, we have uh, Dory Joy uh, in Michigan as well. Um, her question is, I'm curious about a dome greenhouse, uh, sorry, greenhouse to be attached to my dome home um, for any, any, in general growing spaces, I suppose, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Growing spaces makes a great product. Um, they kind of, that's exclusively what they do is, is greenhouse domes. So they... They are always kind of evolving their product, making it a little bit better all the time. And as far as connection to the dome, it's absolutely no problem. You can just put a little connecting link in there, an extension off your dome to connect to this dome. You know, the only thing to keep in mind is what kind of environment is going to be within that dome that is then connected to your dome. Do you want to have a, a weather proof door, you know, like an exterior door going from your dome? Uh, your home dome to the growing dome, you know, that would just be part of what you would want to figure out in the design. Uh, like if you're going to put a hot tub in there with tons of humidity and a cold climate, then you're going to want to, you know, keep in mind, you'll get condensation in that connecting link. So there's just some of those kind of parts to figure out. But in other words, this is a great company that we recommend often for people are looking for greenhouse domes uh, and their website. I think it's just growingspaces.com. And uh, so, yeah, good place to kind of look at and, and check out their systems. You know, they're not as robust of a connection system as what we do, but of course, you're also not building a home out of it. It's, it's, it's a little more affordable as a result and um, light duty, but it does great for a greenhouse. So that would be our kind of go-to recommendation for that. One quick uh, answer, or not answer, but a comment on that is that when we visited um, Sandra and Oli up in uh, northern Norway, the neighbor across the street from where they were building had a greenhouse. This is north of the Arctic Circle, and they had plants galore inside of the greenhouse, and they loved it. It worked all year round. Um, they also, uh, Sandra's sister, built the dome. If you if you go to Norway dome all glass or something like that. You'll see their dome. They built a glass dome and the glass dome was made from a company out of England. Put that up and inside of it built a three-story or really two-story with a sun deck on the top, um, cob house that didn't have to be waterproof because the dome provided all the waterproofers. And they were literally 200 feet off the ocean. So um, greenhouse domes work very well. Uh, the glass dome concept uh, works. You can build a house inside of it. But uh, we do what we do in a certain way and with certain things because we've learned our systems and we specialize in the things that we do. So um, that's what we really say. And if you want to uh, try something different, we can help you and guide you along that line. 
Excellent. Thanks for that question, Dory. Uh, let's see. Next up, we have uh, Josh in Spokane, Washington. Uh, it says, I have a small 40 by 150 foot urban parcel in the Perry District of Spokane. I am exploring floor plans and have always wanted a geodesic dome. Plus, it would fit very nice in this space as it is currently wooded and surrounded by vacant land. Um, at that point, it wants to have some general consultation and estimates and ability to talk to you guys and ask questions, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, there's just one more question after this. And, and basically, the answer to, to her question is that's what we do. We offer consultation services and we will work with you on the plans. Uh, we do draw plans complete. We have a structural engineer or structural engineers that are registered in all 50 states. Well, they can provide engineering for Canada, for other areas. So this is where um, we want to use our background of 50 years of experience to show you kind of examples, what works, talk to you about what works, what doesn't. Um, and that's, that's what you need. And that's why we are here. I, I love to talk to people. Um, yes, I know I talk too much. I got too many stories from my history, um, but that's, uh, that's going to be your, your benefit. Uh, you come to dome school, you learn a lot in dome school and you see our domes here. And we love to have people visit our domes. Give us a call. If you're in the area, call us beforehand, but it is open. Uh, during the weekdays. If you want to come in the evening or on a weekend, set it up with us. Um, if we're not here, if we go, we could be vacation in northern Minnesota. This isn't far enough north, so we go to northern Minnesota by the Canadian border, uh, where it was 31 below the other day. Real time. Real, that's Fahrenheit. That's probably centigrade, too. Um, so that really answers your question. You know, uh, just talk to us. That's our office structure right there in front of you. So there's one last question, Derek, you wanna just uh, quickly answer that one? Uh, sure, uh, the question is from uh, uh, Angela is, she's a member of a glamping donor association and beginning stages of building out uh, a glamp ground outside of Austin, Texas. Um, we've had a lot of customers recently that have done that. In fact, uh, Michigan State Park has built a couple of smaller domes, 18-foot diameter domes. Um, there's one of them there. Um, we have another gentleman that has is building four 29-foot diameter domes. So we definitely have smaller domes that are, are well-suited for the glamping business. Um, they do cost a little bit more than your traditional canvas-covered or poly-covered uh, glamping domes, but of course they they don't require um, new covers every so many years. I mean, they're more of a permanent structure. So long run, they they seem to really math out to the advantage. So, but but yeah, absolutely. You can say like Dennis said, that could be another consultation maybe where we could talk about your specific project and what it is you needed to do or what you're trying to do and, and how many domes and what size domes. Um, to try to see if that might be a solution for you, but we can definitely help with that. So we've shifted. That's interesting. Up. You pulled that picture up, Tanner. I haven't seen that one yet. So <laughs> he's quick. We've shipped uh, two of the four domes, and then in the spring, we're shipping the other two domes to Northern North Carolina or Western North Carolina uh, for a glamping dome complex of four domes. And we have another customer that's about to do a double or uh, two domes uh, in another area. So yes, it is a situation with uh, clamping and Airbnb and VRBO. This is all a possibility that uh, has existed in the recent years. And it works great in the dome. Um, so that's all we can really say. Tessa, you coming over here to say, <laughs> come in here to give me the hook, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we are at 640. Um, there are a few questions in the chat, but I don't know if we have yeah. time this week or should we? Is, well, is I, 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 can, I can maybe we can. Move on to the quick ones we can try. We got a couple of quick ones here. One was asking how you heat your in-floor system uh, with propane boiler, question mark. And you guys have both options there. You have electric or natural gas would be the options on that one. 
Um, let's see. We got um, and propane up at the cabin. We have uh, two options there. Electric. Yeah. 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 So you can do uh, yeah, all three options are available. Uh, uh, David said he understands uh, 200 feet was the recommended max length for any one zone tubing. Um, usually they kind of give you 300 feet as a good recommended for half inch to five eighths inch tubing for a recommended max, but you can go up to 350. So I'm not sure I'd have to look and see if anything's changed on that, but I think it should be 300 to 350. Uh, let's see. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, somebody just sent a cool picture of their foundation. That looks pretty awesome. They're hoping to be living in their dome by next Christmas. And then we got one that says it's, it's got a lot of questions, and I'm not sure exactly what they're wanting from Tamara. Um, so I don't know if you're on Tamara still. If you are, if you want to jump in and maybe ask ask what you're thinking there. Um, other words, we can maybe save that one because it looks like it could be pretty in depth to try to anticipate what she's asking here if she's not on board. Are you there tomorrow? So we can maybe not worry about that one, but well, she's she's listed as a, a, attending. She may not be a, a mic or she may not be able to. Oh, yeah, right at the very end here, she says thank you at seven thirty. So we she, we might have just missed her, but um, <laughs> all right, okay. All right. Well, <laughs> sorry we went so far over. We tried to get all the questions squeezed in. We just happen to have a lot of questions this particular go around. So, um, but it looks like we got them all. So that's good. Good variety, and I hope uh, hope we answered enough. And if we haven't, call us and email us. And as I say, every time build a dome big enough, you can walk in. <laughs> Especially in Minnesota when it's so cold and slippery. Um, anywhere like that or anywhere in the south when it gets really, really hot. Find yourself a, a big open space in your dome. You can walk around and climb upstairs and do all kinds of stuff and get your steps in. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, Tessa. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you for staying, uh, everybody. Bye-bye. See you next Thank time. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, Good night. guys.